lost media in motorsports is very common, from missing footage to rare paint schemes that have never seen the light of day. For NASCAR, it's happened on multiple occasions, while for the ARCA Racing Series, it's taken place on only two occasions. Both taking place at Daytona, ironically, the first was in 1979 when Kyle Petty got his first win, and the more infamous was the 1990 Daytona ARCA race, which saw an extremely horrific crash that dissuaded the broadcasting company from even airing it. But today, we're going to talk about it. This is the story of ARCA's lost media, the 1990 Daytona ARCA 200. It was the 27th running of the event. Number 45, Patty Moy started on the pole with number 29, Bob Keselowski, on the outside front row. Number 80 of Jimmy Horton started 13th, and number 95, Slick Johnson, started 39th on the last row of the grid after he was involved in a practice crash and elected to go to a backup car for the race. The green flag dropped on February 11th. Number 29, Keselowski, shot into the lead on the first lap, holding it for 21 laps before dropping it to the number 72 of Tracy Leslie. Number 72, Leslie, held on to the lead until lap 28. But number 45, Moise, regained it for the first time in the race since the start of the race. She defended it until number 28, Tommy Riggins, passed her on lap 35. However, number 28, Riggins, was only able to maintain the top position for five laps until the zero of Charlie Glotzbach, who started the race shotgun on the field, got to the front and held it for a longest duration of 31 laps before number 80 Horton moved past him on lap 71. Following a spin of the zero of Glotz back, Horton briefly engaged in a duel with number 74 Ken Reagan, but he successfully made the final lead change on lap 76 before the inevitable crash. While the action up front was wild, the race was also notable for its crashes, with four serious ones occurring in the event. A total of seven incidents occurred that prompted 25 of the 80 lap race to be run under caution. Many blame the driver's lack of experience and a high turnover experience competitors for the incidents, with race winner Jimmy Horton stating it was just a case of people getting in over their heads. By lap 75, over 11 cars had retired from the race, but the worst was yet to come. Just one lap later, on lap 76, number 95 Slick Johnson was competing at the front of the field unfortunately got loose and spun between turns three and four while driving too low on the track. This caused his number 95 Pontiac to slam backwards into the outside wall while also being hit by the number 51 of David Simcoe, who went on to say following the accident, the 95 car of Johnson just lost it in three and four, got down on the apron and shot back up on the track. There was so much smoke everywhere, I didn't know where to go. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Number 22, Billy Thomas, was also involved and he ended up slimming into the wall almost head on, fracturing his left wrist in the accident. While number 58, Kevin Gundaker, ended up suffering a bruised back. Meanwhile, number 95 Johnson's stricken Pontiac was rolling down to the apron off the track, which caused him to be hit at top speed by two approaching cars. The two cars that are hit him unknown as the broadcast shot away as the accident had occurred. Number 95 of Slick Johnson suffered a basilar skull fracture and multiple chest fractures. He was taken to Halifax Medical Center along with three other drivers who were suffered in accidents that day. However, Johnson was deemed to be in very critical condition and ultimately three days following the accident, Slick Johnson passed away at 41 years old. However, the sadness was not over yet. EMTs had made their way to some of the stalled cars that were in turns three and four. The leaders were still racing back to the caution flag and didn't slow down until they came back around to the crash scene. EMT Mike Staley was attending to the number 58 of Gundaker when out of nowhere, number 29 Bob Keselowski came sliding down the banks at still nearly full speed and slammed into the number 58 of Gundaker. Sadly for Staley, who was standing at Gundaker's window net, had no reaction time and couldn't get out of the way. Staley was launched an estimated 10 feet in the air and landed on the ground with number 29 Keselowski's car partially rolling on top of him. Uh, I came down the back chute. Immediately I saw smoke going into turn three. Didn't realize what the problem was until I saw Slick Johnson sliding up the racetrack. I dove to the bottom of the racetrack to go by. Slick Johnson came back off of the wall, back down the racetrack, and caught me in the right rear. He spun me around, and I slid across the racetrack, 
And I backed into Billy Thomas coming to a rest on the infield coming off turn four. The dispatcher in the tower gave us clearance to go down to the accident scene and start uh, checking out the drivers as we came to them. And Mike got out of the ambulance to go check the driver of the car, and I kept in eye contact with Mike in case Mike needed something. And then I looked back onto the back stretch, and we're just following the cars that had made it through the wreck, and realizing it was under caution, I figured they're racing pretty tightly for being under the caution. And as it came into turn three, I saw a couple cars go three wide, which I thought was, was pretty nuts considering it was a, a caution. And somebody got tapped from behind and came sliding right off the track. Look out, look out. I got out of the race car and I looked over, saw the paramedic underneath the other race car that was involved in the accident. As I was going up to Mike, I truly thought that when I got him untangled and we rolled him over, that I was going to find him dead. I was real surprised to see that he was breathing and that I had, that I had a pulse. When I was able to open up my eyes, I was able to see my friends around me uh, screaming orders to each other, uh, some of them openly weeping and crying. I saw that love of man opening itself up to me, uh, as well as being able to see the sky that there uh, was light at the end of the tunnel. Once we had Mike stabilized on the long backboard, we picked Mike up and uh, carried him toward the helicopter. And it was just about the time that we were loading Mike into the helicopter that our eyes met. And he reached up and, and took my hand and kind of nodded and I put out my hand to Ken to let him know that I knew what was going on and I was maybe searching for a little bit of strength at that time not knowing if I was going to live uh, not being afraid of death but being afraid of not living the accident resulted in Kizilowski injuring his left leg while Staley was in a serious condition including breaking his left leg as well as breaking and burning his left forearm Staley managed to recover, but ultimately could no longer be a paramedic. Staley would later sue Arca in 1991, being awarded over $357,000 in damages. Staley later also provided motivational talks regarding overcoming adversity. Four years later, following the crash, he primarily blamed racing officials for the racing back to the flag rule that enabled drivers to continue competing for the rest of the lap after a crash had occurred believing that the car should have been forced to slow down immediately following the crash. Also notably involved in the crash was the 19 of Chris Gerke, who lost his life just over a year later in another crash at Talladega. With a huge crash and cleanup and only four laps to go, the race ended under caution. Number 80 Jimmy Horton went on to win the race, also collecting $10,700 from the record $136,120 purse only 16 of the 40 starters were running at the end. Horton would go on to say in victory lane, you never want to win a race under caution. You want to finish under green, but somebody's got to be there at the end, and I'm glad it was me. To this day, it is known that ESPN had planned to showcase the race on a tape delay. However, following the accidents, particularly the images of Staley's collision, prevented ESPN from airing the event, with the full race footage yet to be publicly resurfaced to this day as well. Nevertheless, both footage of the accidents are on YouTube after Rescue 911 was allowed to use clips approved by ESPN. The 1990 Daytona Arca 200 might still be in the archives at ESPN. Maybe one day the full race will get uploaded to YouTube, but it's highly unlikely that any of us want to actually watch it due to the events that unfolded. But to this day, it remains the one of the most important pieces of lost media in the history of the Arca Racing Series. Thank you guys for watching this great video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Give it a like, subscribe, and a comment. And take care, guys. Thank you very much.